Good morning, everyone. What you're about to see is uh, a lot of great process and discovery and a journey that each student took in the three quarters that they've been with me for this latest uh, thesis slash capstone process. Julia Newton's process was to explore adaptive reuse of landfills. And Eileen, uh, Eileen, I'm sorry, um, went through this process together with, with this group. And she has a uh, remarkable process of discovery, of research, and now, you know, applying some really topical uh, alternative uses for land skills. Land skills. Julie. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, first, I want to talk about trash, and I want to describe how a landfill works. Uh, there's a diagram up here. Basically, you carve a hole in the earth or in a canyon. You line it. You fill it with trash. You compress it. You put soil on top. And at the end of its term, when the landfill is full, you cap it with compacted clay. There, that's as simple as it is. There are two byproducts of a landfill. One is methane gas, which is highly toxic to the atmosphere. And it's uh, required by law to be uh, uh, collected and either burned off or sent to a gas to energy uh, treatment center. The other byproduct is leachate, which is the liquid that comes off of a landfill. And it's highly toxic as well. And by law, it's required to be collected and treated uh, so that it doesn't infect the groundwater. Um, what's interesting to me about trash is the way it compacts and compresses as it rots. Um, a tin can will uh, decompose slower than a tomato. So what happens to the trash is it compresses and crunches up. And the ground plane, the surface of the landfill, um, likewise subsides and settles and shifts and moves, much like this diagram. So what you have here when you're designing on a landfill is you're, you're designing on a dynamic surface, a dy dynamic ground plane. And just to give you an idea, if you d build a road in year one, it looks like that straight line. In year two, it's a dip. In year five to six, it starts dipping and buckling. And by the end of 30 years, it's really a roller coaster. And I've driven on these roads, and I can tell you that that's what it is. So what does this mean for design? It means you can't put concrete on the top of a landfill. You can't put foundations on top of a landfill. You can't put anything impermanent on top, I mean permanent, on top of a landfill. You can't put any ponds, any enclosures. You can't drill down through the trash to the bedrock and, and stabilize your structures. What you can do, which is great, is you can build temporary structures, ephemeral structures, flexible structures, recyclable structures. And that's why I call this ephemeral park, because everything in this park can flex and move and flow. Uh, this is my concept diagram. My thesis uh, concept is to design and redesign a closed, clean, remediated landfill for um, community recreation, for habitat restoration, and for energy production. And I'm embracing this dynamic ground plane by showing movement in the topography and also using flexible, temporary, ephemeral structures that are movable as well. Here's my diagram. It starts with a very polluted world down here with lots of landfills. And with habitat restoration as a driver, it goes through education, beauty, energy, and recreation to give us a beautiful, clean world. My goals in this project are to preserve the habitat link between Upper Newport Bay and Bomber Canyon. My site is here in Newport Beach, San Joaquin Hills, right outside. And as you can see, it's between Upper Newport Bay, which is a very sensitive wetland area, and Bomber Canyon and Shady Canyon, which is part of this very long wildlife corridor that goes way south of Laguna Beach. And my site is right in the middle of it. What I hope to do is connect these back the way they were before we put a landfill there. Um, I also hope to preserve the important bird area aspect of this site. It is an important bird area designated by Audubon. 
and I want to preserve it by increasing the coastal sage scrub, which will protect the little coastal California gnatcatcher, which uses that as its only habitat, and it's an endangered species. Um, I also want to bring education uh, to the community about energy and uh, environment and waste. I also want to bring recreation to the community, active and passive. I want to uh, find alternative energy sources on the site for it to power the community. And I want to add beauty to the landscape. Uh, Luis Barragan said, uh, the word beauty has disappeared from the lexicon of architects and landscape architects, and we should bring it back. So I'm doing that, leaving no uh, carbon footprint. And lastly, I want to begin to undo a bit of the damage that we do by making these landfills in the first place. So the program really reflects that. The program is recreational activities, uh, habitat restoration, learning centers and nodes. Um, the beauty aspect will be in kinetic art that's all over uh, the design. And uh, the programs really reflect the goals. So moving toward the site analysis, there are only three things I need you to remember. Uh, the first is that if you notice this main ridge line in the topography, it starts at the high point, which is 600 feet of elevation, and goes to a low point of 200 feet of elevation. And as you see, it starts going north, and then it veers northwest. That's important to remember for later. And then I wanted to point out the buildable areas on this site. These are areas that are not refuse. They're native soil, and they're up here at the, the top and the bottom, and along the sides here. There you can put a building, you can put a pond, etc. Here are, is the habitat easement that was required by the closure documents in 1990. They required 104 acres of coastal sage scrub uh, planted in a mitigation planting, and that is there today. That's important to remember. And also over here, I want to point out the uh, connectivity of Route 73 uh, major streets, but also there are a couple schools here, public and private. And right here, there's a little park next to my landfill, and the little park is private and has a no trespassing sign. So I'm hoping to make this a nice public park where everybody can go. My concept development had three stages. The first stage was uh, a basic stage where habitat was the major driver. Next to that, recreation, energy, and learning and beauty. And then I discovered that around here, about a quarter of a mile from my site, there were findings of petroglyphs and uh, pictographs from the Tongva people, the early uh, Native American tribe. Um, and they depicted a rattlesnake, which was a, a messenger of Shinishnish, this great Tongva god. And uh, they are the red diamond. They're signified by a red diamond. So I incorporated that into my, into my concept. And then the last uh, stage of my concept development, um, I wanted an axial uh, organization of the site. So I went back to this main ridge, um, and I made an axis that went from the high point due north, and then from northwest to southeast down the length of the site. And the final axis is this swerving axis that you can see that recalls the rattlesnake. So let me now move to the design. The design has six main areas. It has a wetland, constructed wetland to the north. It has a kayak pond to the south. It has a uh, visitor center here at the entry. And it's got three separate recreation areas on the site. Um, let me begin where you would come in to the site. This is the visitor center, which is right here. And the visitor center uh, has this structure. And please note the shape of the structure. I'll talk about that in a little minute. You get to it. It's on a very high promontory and very narrow. So I put in people movers, like at Hollywood Bowl, to get people up there. And it's a place for conferences, classrooms. You could have a 300-person wedding up there. It's approximately 7,800 square feet. And then outside, you have uh, tables and chairs that are casual amongst the grasses. You have kinetic art there. You have solar lighting there that's also wrapped in photovoltaic film, so it's generating electricity, and a beautiful, beautiful view of the whole site. After the knoll, if you come down here to the major recreation area, I call that the gathering hub. Here's an overview of that. 
You'll notice red and white balloons. I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, there are these fields of red and white balloons to come and a little forest of trees. And then your recreation is you've got volleyball, bocce, badminton, and horseshoes down here. And then you've got more passive recreation in these low berms, these low undulating berms that will repeat in the design um, where people can picnic and dance on top of the berms and uh, have pickup soccer games. And they can also watch performances for, from these berms. As you notice, when you come into the site, you can either go straight to this fabulous piece of art. I used Alexander Calder um, because he is such an um, inspiration to me. The way his uh, mobiles move captures the movement of this site. So I use that here. And you can go straight down to that or to the little playground over here. But the kids are going to run down this path through the balloons. And that's because the balloons are solar balloons. They're made of photovoltaic film. They have a solar element inside. But they're also connected to pavers that have piezoelectric elements. So when they jump on these pavers, they can light up the balloons. They can change color of the balloons. However you program it, uh, they can do that. And it's a great play area. Even their playground has kinetic features. Uh, the swings, the vibration of the swings is connected and picks up kinetic art. Uh, they have twirling things that pick up kinetic art and piezoelectric uh, small toys that they can jump on and make sound. Let me talk about these uh, energy fields as long as we're talking about the balloons. These balloons generate about 14,000 megawatt hours annually, which will power about 140 homes. But I have other uh, energy fields that power more homes. Over here, I have something called the electric meadow, and you can see it. Here I've got all the energy fields laid out, and you can check that out when you come up. Um, this is the electric meadow, and these are long rods that sway in the breeze, and as the birds land on them, and the animals play in them, and the and people play in them, and they're out in the fields, and they generate their vi their swaying generates uh, approximately enough power for 3,000 homes. Um, each hundred square foot array. Uh, produces 45 megawatt, uh, yes, megawatt hours annually. So this is about 11, 12 acres. That's about 3,000 homes. Uh, the last energy uh, aspect we have is on this. I call this the energy bridge, and I'll discuss what else it does. But the sides are sheathed with uh, photovoltaic film, so they are actually generating electricity, um, solar-wise, as they're laying there. This energy path is a boardwalk about 10 feet wide that just sits on top of the surface, so it can move with the surface. Moving along to other recreation areas, um, this is uh, next door here is a BMX bike park. And I did that so kids in the neighborhood could get rough and dirty and really have fun. It also has a place for parents to uh, take their families and bike on cross-country trails. There are advanced BMX trails. There are uh, beginner BMX trails. And there are uh, what are called flow trails for practicing. And if you notice the shape of these jumps, this is a shape that recurs throughout the site. And it's meant to capture movement, although this is the way you build BMX jumps. Um, it just happens to work out that way. And it's one of the reasons I chose this as a recreation area. The last recreation area up here is a disc golf course. I had wanted to put in a golf course, sustainable golf course, but I didn't have enough room. This golf, for those of you who don't know, is golf played with frisbees instead of golf clubs. It has fairways and tees. And over here, you can see a fellow. Um, here he is. He's uh, teeing off, as they say, with his frisbee. And I put a lot of trees in this area because it makes it harder to hit the target with a frisbee. And here you have him reaching the target, which are these baskets uh, that are about uh, four or 500 feet away. Um, in this disc golf, in the hours that disc golf is not allowed, is a little Tongva village. It's a little replica based on Rancho Santa Ana Tongva village, and it's for kids. It's a learning center for kids. It's a place they can come and play, but it's also a place they can learn about energy and waste and the environment. And the other learning centers, as long as I'm on that, are up here at the wetlands. There's a structure with a classroom and little decks that come off um, in the wetlands that you can have classes. Obviously, the main class area is the Knoll uh, Visitor Center. And um, along the energy bridge, these little bulb outs are places for not only birders, but you can have an impromptu 
outdoor classroom. So let me move to the wetlands and the habitat. Uh, the wetlands are a constructed wetland. It's surrounded by an ephemeral wetland for stormwater uh, issues. Uh, as I said, there are decks off it. Um, and it's the first in the connection with the, it's the first in the connection with the um, Upper Newport Bay uh, habitat. And we move through all the different habitats that transition us over to bombers. So this is coastal sage scrub. This is um, southern uh, oak woodland. This is native grassland and back to riparian. And all of these are reflected over here and the critters. Here's the coastal sage scrub, riparian, and southern oak woodland. Lastly, I want to talk about the pond. The pond is a kayak pond. You can get to it by the main entrance. And you can also get to it, there is a pedestrian ramp here at the south part of the site where all these folks who live in all these apartment buildings can come and walk down the ramp and be at the kayak pond. It's a kayak pond, but it's also for canoes. And as you can see, it's quite lovely and restful. Here's the ramp. Uh, here it's an ADA ramp. And here there's another piece of kinetic art. But you can see when you come up all the little places where there's kinetic art. So in closing, really what I want to say is I don't want, I love this design and I think it's so much fun, but I don't want to ever lose sight of the fact that landfills are not okay. It's not okay to have landfills. Um, they destroy our ecologies. They destroy our soil structure. They're poisonous. This is the best we can do with a bad situation, but I want everybody to think about this fact. My park is ephemeral. My park can go away tomorrow. But this trash is here forever, forever, infinity. So when we think about what we throw away and we think about what we have to buy in that new iPad we have to buy this year, we should think about that. And I leave you with one resource that you all should read. It's fantastic. It's called Garbology. It's a book by Edward Humes. He's a Pulitzer Prize winning author and it will change your life thinking about waste. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions or comments? Jim. Hey, Jim. Um, it's a nice, nice slide. Thank you. But I have a couple of questions. Okay. In a short way. But the first one is geographical. You said it's a private park, and uh, which one are you saying? Right here. Uh, it's a little private it's park. It's a public park on the corner. No, okay. this is private. It says private. There's a no trespassing sign. We're on the corner. Yeah. Here? That, that, That's a community right. center. And a baseball field is also. I thought that was part of the private park. There's a sign on it. There's a sign that says no trespassing. Yeah. I know it's been used. Well, it could be, but I was chewed off of there, I can tell you. <laughs> and I tried to crawl in there, and I was chewed away. Um, my question is sort of a formal one. If the land is moving yes. all the time, why did you pick what I'll call very defined oval shapes? Well, I'll tell you exactly. That's a great question. I'm so glad you asked that. If you look at the topography, which you can see in these, you can see the topography. I started from the high point of the site. And the high point is a high point for about a second and a half. The contour is about that big. The next contour, that's the 600 foot elevation contour. The next contour is 590 feet and it's a perfect oval around that high point. So this virtually traces that contour. And then once I started using it, for a while these were square and these were round and whatever, and then I began to use it as a theme throughout the park, and I liked the kind of organic shape of it, I liked, but it really came from the contour of the topography. Then, then I have a two program questions. Okay. And the first one is, I think you put parking in there? Oh, yeah. There's parking, parking, uh, handicap parking, handicap parking, and there's parking all the way down by the pond and parking up by the wetland. And then the last one is the kayak pond. Yes. And I guess I'm going to phrase it as why a kayak pond on a mountain when you need to go to that day. Because you might live here and you can walk it over. You might live nearby. 
And where, where is it? The it's kayak pond is right here. <laughs> no, but you can drive. You can drive here and go there. But you only have to if you have to drive. You can drive from your apartment here, up here, and down here and park and kayak and go be home by lunch. It's much more convenient. Maybe not as pretty. I know it's pretty over there, but but you'll be home by lunch. <laughs> yes. For the younger. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's a beautiful project. I think one one of the pieces that's harder to see is the circulation. Okay. We talked about the connection for you know in terms of habitat. Right. But it would be great to see how they actually come to the park and just to really have the park be more identified or for other means. You talked about it's so it's, it's, it's kind of in the legend, but that's okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So definitely. <laughs> and I I. Take, take your note and let me just add to that. Um, the parking is, the, I left the parking white so it would be more visible. But also, um, I did not say, there is an existing asphalt road that goes the entire perimeter of this site. And there's um, a class two bike lane that I put on that. It's three and a half miles in circumference. So you can really come off this, where they have the city bike lane. You can come off of that because Newport Coast Road is so fast and you can come into this park here and then you can just go around the park and you can come in and do BMX or you can just do this little loop but the fact is if you want your three and a half mile workout either jogging or biking you can go around the whole perimeter. Jim and Andy. Um, uh, thoughtful project. Uh, very pertinent to me because we just inherited the Pointy Hills land which connects Whittier Narrows to the Pointy Hills Open Space Corridor to Chino. You can go a whole bunch of different right. directions up and down the San Gabriel River and so on. I don't see that kind of context here. I think the context is missing. And Why? I don't understand if this is regional, local. Uh, I think you've got programming that's very extensive. and. The focus here is on habit, habitat restoration mm -hmm. or the spine of what was there. Mm -hmm. Personally, from a parks planning standpoint, mm -hmm. you kind of got everything in there to get the center. So I would be a little more refined about what this place is and make it a regional draw um, because you have so many components that are a mystery to people that have to deal with landfill, and they always end up being a park uh -huh. or a golf course or the uh -huh. water line. Park. But the point is, is, is this regional? I think the educational component of what the habitat was and what landfills do to destroy that and how you're trying to turn it around uh, is more important than kayaking and that kind of stuff. They well, yeah, but that's like do that. Yeah, that's, so that's, that's, that's my, part my, of it. So my point is, I, I don't, I, your bubble diagram is wonderful, the concept diagram. Mm -hmm. And I'm with Jim a little bit. Those forms seem to come from that, and it's hard to read the contours, which is, you know, which is a minor thing, because I know it's hard to show. Yeah, and you can see it with Grade and all that business, but you would think it would be more in relationship to, to the topography and not such a geometric form. But that's well, you know, I, I have to tell you, I have to tell you, Jim, that it's absolutely, everything here is connected to the topography. Everything, everything that's placed here is connected to the topography. And as I was explaining to Jim, these shapes, while they look very formal and maybe um, arbitrary, they are based on the topography. And you can see the topographical, you can see the topographical, uh, excuse me, excuse me. You can see the topographical map here. And also, to your point of context, I just want to say, that as I explained here, this is part of this entire wildlife corridor. This is my site, this is Upper Newport Bay, and this is a huge wildlife corridor. That's the context of it, and it's a link. And at one time, excuse me? That needs to be a bigger, a bigger drawing? Okay. But at one time, if you, if, you, if you, I did this, I draped it in SketchUp, and you can see where the 73 chop that wildlife corridor in half because where the knoll is, where this little restaurant is, that's like the, the tag end, the little tailbone of this entire wildlife corridor. 
So I can make that bigger because I think that's a really important, you're exactly right. I wouldn't be at this site. I would be at Puente Hills, but I wanted to connect these habitats. That's really important to me. Yes, ma'am. Meg, Andy, and then Gemini. So I have many other questions, but since you're talking about this, I'll ask this. Okay. Since, you, since your main goal, as you just said, is to connect your two wildlife areas, how did you do that? Well, I did it by putting a wetland up here that will, I mean, I can't literally connect it because there's a highway and buildings and all I that. That's what you were doing. But no, I am connecting it by having, continuing a wetland over here that is reflecting the upper Newport Bay. And then I'm transitioning through all these different habitats that are present in Bomber to continue the wildlife corridor over here to Bomber Canyon. So I'm much wildlife. closer to Bomber Canyon over here. So you have, a, so you have four parking lots? Yes, I have uh, actually six. I have four main ones, and then I have a special one for the pond and a special one for the wetlands. Pardon, but it's just parking lots and wildlife that usually go together. So I kind of, I'm wondering if the parking lots could have gone in a, another location that wasn't on that track. Well, it seems like you put the restaurant and the parking lots on the track of the wildlife corridor. Well, the whole thing is a wildlife corridor. The whole place is a wildlife corridor. So, and these parking lots aren't concrete park, asphalt car, parking lots. They're gravel and dirt and plants. So it's, this is a very informal parking lot. I mean, it looks formal here, yeah. but it's not concrete. And there's no place on the site you could put it that wouldn't be in habitat. So. Well, first I have to compliment you on this project. I think it's absolutely great what you've done. You explained it extremely well. This happens to be in my backyard. I'm Is very, it? I'm very familiar with this. In fact, 30 years ago, I contributed to the land. Really? <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> oh, I was going to get excited, and now I'm not so happy. I thought I saw your trash on this landfill. Yeah. So, but, um, so I'm very, very familiar with this. And, and for, for those people who may not be as familiar with this area of, of Orange County, this is part of a much larger open space area. It extends all the way from Newport Back Bay and goes all the way down to Laguna Beach Absolutely. and further than that. So this is just a small link in, in an overall big chain and stuff. So I can be uh, near my house and I see uh, Canadian geese flying overhead, honking as they're going over the Back Bay to land or to the golf courses. Or, I mean, it really is a unique place uh, in Orange County. So uh, you explained it very well. I, I just think this is great for what you've done. My only, and this isn't even a criticism, this is a comment. Okay. Kayaking is my life outside of work. And you have to have, in order to make it so that the, the kayak experience is worth doing, yeah. And, has to be a large enough body of water. Okay, yeah, this is kind of tiny. It's a little bit on it's the tiny, small but that side, was so the only native land I had. Right. So <laughs> maybe it's not kayak per se. Maybe it's more of a you know a small wetland area. Yeah, that, a continued you know, wetland. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are some great examples of that not very far away from this site that your land company has. Actually, it's part of the uh, Irvine Ranch Water District mm -hmm. ponds. Yeah. And, I went there. You know, they those, those are great. So that might be a, a better use of that. Right? Well, Andy, I have to tell you, I was urged by one of my instructors who loves kayaking to put a kayak <laughs> on him. I did it for Eileen. I wanted to put it at wetland, Andy. Yeah, she right. insisted that. Kayaking is a great idea, but as Jim was saying, you have Newport back. Yeah, he's right. He's right. And it's far more beautiful over yeah, there. But I just, you know, for the people who live nearby, I just wanted them to have a little something. But you're right. I, as I put it in, I thought, man, this is mighty tiny for a kayaking area. I do have just one other question for you, though. And again, being in the area and understanding water use and the problems that our whole area is experiencing right now, mm -hmm. we have Irvine Ranch Water District, which is delivering uh, reclaimed water exactly. to these kind of areas. How are you providing water to this site? I'm so glad you asked. Because my friend at, uh, at okay, but my friend at Irvine Ranch Water District uh, got his little maps out, 
and I have a turnout for reclaimed water up here for my wetland. I also have a turnout here um, at the uh, entry, and I think there are others, but we kind of stopped there because that's where I needed it. But I wouldn't be surprised if they're all up and down this. They had this entire area piped. And so all the irrigation to put in, in plants will be that reclaimed water, and up in the wetland will be reclaimed. Jim, then Stephanie. Just Jim? One. Jim. 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 J
and there's a little tenuous right around the floor. Which is six miles north of the Yeah, but the point is the thing that stops it from crossing is kind of the same as we So mm -hmm. the same connection, I kind of need to show this whole thing. The bigger out gets, out gets to the sea, okay. show it to the bay, and then say, you know, hard for us. Right. An animal. Or an animal. Right. Because you're right, we go close to that. It's a, it's a, a road to walk across. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is not having an island there. I live in Oh, yeah. And it took me a while to um, And then you call that San Joaquin Hills, California. Well, they they put it that in Google Earth. They yeah, said that. They, yeah, but it's they like it over there. But it is Newport Beach. It's just Newport, a subdivision. Of Newport. Newport Coast is where yeah. the people live, I think. Yeah. I'm proud of that. Yeah. Um, so putting in the road name, the Sagefield School, you're and right. all that stuff. You're, you're exactly right. And then that to it's really a planning concept. Mm -hmm. And if these things are about playing with the existing topography, then those lines should be very clear so that they're not too big. Right. And then if there are all these roads, then there should be a plan that maybe it's like a phase where it's messy. Mm -hmm. And then later it becomes a sort of very clean. Well, it actually will work opposite. If I built this, this would be day one. By day, by year uh, 10, these roads are not going to be straight and nice. These no, shapes are not going to be the same. The oh, you mean uh, uh, the, the outside? In oh, there. in here. That's, that's part of the yeah. It just got very distracting. It's a lot of stuff. So I, I chose to leave in, so it looked like a landfill. I chose to leave in these maintenance roads up here with the benching, but it really was very distracting. Yeah, my, my point is that You'd rather see that? Well, it's not about rather. It's about dealing with what it's going to okay. be. And so then it reduces it and it goes back to what you call the middle detail. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like a planning document that you can go out and do this and do that. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So what happens this week? And there's mm -hmm. going to be all these spaghetti mm -hmm. And to me, that <coughs> and the connection to the part of the world of animals is really, really important. Okay. Um, okay. Because I worked well down on the other end of Farmer Canyon for quite a year long time. Right. And so that's on the other side of the freeway. Right. And you say Bomber Canyon, but I don't see it on the picture. Yeah, you're right. But it's a big thing. You're right. Yeah, it's, it's too much. And I, and I didn't label it here either. You're right. Yeah, and it needs yeah. to be diagrammatic. Did I write? Oh, yeah, I did. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. I did. And I did Upper Newport Bay, but it should be said on the big plan. Yeah. Yeah, well, but I mean, there should be this diagram. Is it mountains? Oh, I see. Uh, okay. Diagram. Okay. okay. Uh, Julia, the only thing I and I'm going to give you a hard time over this. Okay. Is your your analysis is limited to what is on um, the perimeter road? You don't address anything on the outside. Any of the any of who's living there, whether they're regional, anything. It is, and you didn't address it here. So a lot of times, the thing that I when we go to award panels and mm -hmm. jurors here, mm -hmm. they say. These are little islands. Nobody talks about what's next to it. Nobody talks about how the freeway affects the flyway and mm -hmm. the birds, how you're going to get somebody over whatever that freeway is because it's not labeled. Mm -hmm. uh, a, a wildlife corridor co covers salamanders and Canadian geese, which you can kill as far as I'm concerned because they're trophy geese. Oh. Um, all those little Canadian, critters. All those critters. Yeah. So, uh, but I, there are other things in a wildlife corridor besides a bird. Oh, I know. And I so I don't there. see how you connect Bomber Canyon to this. Oh, I see. I see what so you're saying. So the real connection that you could have done that mm -hmm. would have shown true um, real sensitivity, that's why I was giving you the... That's okay. <laughs> that's okay. And so that, I hope you will address it in your book. Oh, absolutely. That, all of that is in the book because I have all of that analysis. And I did point out where the schools are because there are kids involved in the park. But you're right. I should have talked about who these guys are who are living here. Believe me, all that's in the book. And are they in favor? 
Are they what? Yeah, in fact, they are. Uh, the uh, supervisor of the county wants to put in yet another uh, golf course there. And there is a, a small and vocal minority who go to all the meetings who want to park. So they do want to park. So, and all the minority. The minority. The North Coast is a strange I know. Well, that's what I particularly like uh, about this design is that it's got that kind of button-down anal design of Newport Beach, that kind of tidy whatever. Um, but it's a wild fish. That's what I like about it. All right, come on up and look at the boards. Okay. Thank you.